In response to another question, Powell tried to convince everybody how vigilant the Fed was going to be with respect to winning its inflation fight, that it said it wasn't going to declare victory quickly, that it was going to make certain that inflation was in fact coming down before it claimed victory. It wanted convincing evidence that inflation was coming down. And to me, that's kind of a cop-out. That's not really a legitimate victory because signs that inflation is coming down, what does that mean? I mean, that doesn't mean it's gonna keep coming down. What Powell was saying is, hey, inflation's eight and a half. If it comes down to 5% and we're pretty sure it's gonna keep coming down, well, maybe we'll declare victory. Why? If inflation's still 5%, it's still more than double 2%. I think what Powell would have to state if the Fed really was determined to make sure it eradicated inflation for good, it wouldn't be talking about any victory claims simply because inflation was headed down. They want to make sure that it is down and that it stays down. So what Powell should have said is we will not back off until not only inflation has returned to 2%, but that it stayed at 2% long enough so that we're convinced that it's going to stay down there and not go right back up. Because what happens if inflation's 8.5% and then it goes down to 5 or 4% and the Fed is, okay, great, it's going to go to 2 and it never hits 2. And the next thing you know, it goes up to 10. The Fed can't take any chances. But I think the Fed is already setting the markets up for a premature victory claim because I think the Fed knows it can't actually beat inflation, but it's hoping that maybe it can fool the markets into thinking that it beat it and it can pretend that it beat it by declaring victory even though a victory hadn't been won. Powell also got a question about the elusive soft landing. He was asked if he still believed a softish landing was possible, to which Powell said, yes, it's still possible. Now, he wouldn't put any probability as to whether he thinks it's likely that we're going to have a soft landing or a softish, meaning a bumpy landing, meaning a landing where the plane doesn't crash and blow up and everybody on board dies. He said, no, there's a chance that we could have some kind of softish landing, but he doesn't know how high the probability is. But he kind of defined a soft landing as inflation coming down to 2% by 2024 meaning that it's still above 2% until then, meaning the high prices continue to get higher and the unemployment rate doesn't rise much above four and a half. Or I think he threw something like that out as a sign of a good outcome that unemployment went up, but it didn't go up that much. And one of the reasons he thought that he'd be able to get rid of inflation so quickly was because he claimed that it's new, that we just got this inflation. It's not like it's been here for a long time. And so easy come, easy go. It just came around and now we're going to get rid of it. And the public doesn't expect it to continue because it's so new. And all of that is simply not true. And again, we have had inflation for a long time. It's just that the public wasn't complaining about it for a long time because it wasn't this extreme, but we still had it. And of course, when inflation was predominantly in financial assets, nobody complained. And of course, in the early days of this inflation, if you go back to 2008, 9, 10, the Fed created a lot of inflation. But what that did was prevent prices from falling, not really pushing prices up. If it wasn't for QE1 and QE2, the Great Recession would have been much greater and we actually would have seen a healthy decline in the cost of living and consumer prices. Why didn't that happen? Well, because the Federal Reserve printed all this money. In fact, I was listening to an interview on Kitco with economic professor Stephen Hankey. He's at John Hopkins. He's also a fellow at Cato. He's relatively good and he understands inflation. He knows it's about money supply. The only thing I disagreed with him about in that entire Kitgo interview is when he was talking about QE1, 2, and 3 and why it wasn't inflationary because he correctly pointed out that the people who don't think all the money that we printed during COVID is the reason we have inflation and they claim, well, we printed all this money after the 2008 financial crisis and that didn't cause inflation. So that proves that money printing doesn't cause inflation, even though money printing is inflation. Stephen Hankey debunked that, but he didn't really debunk it in the right way. What Hankey said is that in order to have inflation, you have to have an increase in the money supply 
and credit, because a lot of the money comes into existence from bank credit. And he pointed out that during the Great Recession, private credit was contracting. And so even though the government was expanding the money supply, it was simply offsetting a contraction that was taking place in private credit. And as a result, we didn't have the big inflation because in aggregate, we didn't see the big credit expansion because the government was simply offsetting something that was being lost. But what Professor Hankey missed out on was the point that had the government not done that, prices would have gone down. The fact that they went up a little instead of going down a lot is still a lot of inflation. The public was still robbed of the benefit of lower prices by inflation, and that inflation still did damage to the underlying structure of the economy, and we're still paying the price of that damage now. So for some reason, Hankey overlooks that problem, but I'll overlook that because by and large, he's one of the few economic professors out there that's even close to being right. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now- I have bad news for you. If you're not rich by now, you're screwed. And if you're in debt, you're even double screwed. How so, you might wonder. Well, the sad truth is that you're working your whole life to make someone else rich. The mega corporations, the banks, the politicians, everyone is getting richer. They get your money. And what is even worse, they get your time. They get your life. You are not even in a rat race. You're in a financial prison. But what could a solution for you look like? Honestly, I don't know. But I know what a solution for me would look like. It's very simple. I use whatever money I have and I multiply it with 1,000. This could make my life much easier and probably yours as well. If you have $1,000 available and multiply this with 1,000, I believe that this could solve some financial issue for the one or the other. Of course, if you're ugly, you would have to multiply it with much more than 1,000. My name is Marco Stan, and this is what I decided to do. I decided to 1,000x my money. This is not a joke. I know what you may be thinking. You know, what, what, what is this guy talking about? You know, how should this work? This is not possible. Well, I made a detailed video where I laid out my plan. And some clever folks might even want to look at this plan and copy it and do exactly what I do. This is just a little hint on the side. You have two options. You leave. You forget what you have seen. You do whatever you're doing and you hope that somehow you get some other results. Good luck with that. Or you click the link below the video. You enter your email address because I'm not showing this to everybody. You at least watch my video on how I plan to 1000x my money. The choice is yours. Make the right choice. Join me. See what a different future you could have. See at least how I intend, how I plan to do the 1000x. So click on the link below, enter your email address, and I see you on the other side. Your Marco Stan.